And next up, we have um, Joanne Deering. Joanne is a secondary school teacher. She's um, from Ireland. Um, she was acquitted with breastfeeding cancer for a number of years. She's a mum of four. Her third child, Olivia, was very ill after birth and sadly passed away at six weeks of age. She had been exclusively pumping for her. And when she died, she continued to pump to donate Olivia's milk. She's passionate about empowering healthcare professionals to have conversations with bereaved mothers to offer them a choice at a time when it feels like nothing is of their choosing. And thank you, Joanne, for taking your time to talk to us today. I think, um, you know, having you speaking now at the end of our uh, webinar, you know, is, is really important. So we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks, Mill. Um, Gillian, I just have to recompose myself after listening to Holly. Um, I did a very similar experience to Holly in that um, I continued to, to, uh, to express after uh, my little girl passed away. Um, so I just, I suppose, like to start by saying thank you so much uh, to Cora and to Tanya um, and to the entire team we worked on um, the BAPM framework. It is just fantastic. And so much of what Cora said, um, it was like as if she was telling my story. And back in 2014, um, when my little girl Olivia passed away, I really felt completely alone. Um, I went, you know, trawling the internet to look for stories of uh, donation after loss and came across Jessica Wellborn's uh, research. And I found one mum at that time, Amy, um, who donated after her little boy Bryson passed away. So it's it's incredible in, in the seven years since Olivia died to see so much, uh, so much there now that that mums uh, and families have access to and and hopefully that you guys as healthcare providers will will feel really empowered to to have these conversations um, with parents. Um, I'd love to see milk donation uh, become as commonly discussed um I say organ donation or or blood donation because you know neither of those things are for everybody and it's not going to be suitable for everybody in in every circumstance but we know that they're life-giving um and for organ donation you know incredibly healing for both the recipient and the donor families um and it's incredibly meaningful my husband donates blood and he gets a text each time to tell him where his blood has gone and it's just it's fantastic and it's it's really really meaningful um for for all of us um now i'll see if i can move my presentation on i think it's a little bit stuck there If you just click on the actual PowerPoint there, um, Joanna should. Ah, lovely. OK, thank you very much. There we go. Um, so a number of years ago, I came across this quote. When a baby is born, it's a mother's instinct to protect the baby. And when a baby dies, it's a mother's instinct to protect its memory. And it really, really spoke to me um, because, you know, grief is, is complicated. It's messy. Um, but this instinct to protect our children's memory is really, really strong and our need to create meaning um, is, is very much there. Um, I was really lucky to present with Julie Edwards, um, who's a paediatric nurse in the Children's Hospital in Crumlin, um, when she did her master's in bereavement. So I've just stolen her quote here. Um, bereaved parents demonstrate higher rates of complicated grief reactions. Um, and the suggestion is that this occurs in part because parents struggle to find meaning in the loss. And then Urine and Mostel found that a bereaved mother's capacity to find coherent meaning following a devastating loss predicted the extent to which she could effectively move through the grieving process um, and begin to heal. Um, you know, I, I really believe that every parent does something after they lose a child, whether they start running marathons, you know, whether they start fundraising for cuddle cots or for memory boxes or memory packs. Um, some parents set up charities like Avian's Pink Tie and um, Aoife's Clown Doctors. And then for others, it's, it's something else. Um, for me, I donated milk um, and my husband now volunteers with 
um, a little lifetime, which is a support organization here in Ireland that uh, supports uh, parents who've lost a baby around uh, the perinatal period. Um, so after Olivia was born and was very unwell and, and subsequently passed away, I, I really, really struggled with um, my identity. And I suppose finding out who people are at, at talks like these is usually my favourite bit. Um, but a little while ago, I was hand, handed a badge when I was doing a similar talk. And you see there the badge, Joanne Deere, mother of Olivia. And it, it's lovely to spend a little time just being Olivia's mum, and I suppose I don't get to mention her uh, too much. This is Olivia. Uh, she was born at term plus nine after a seemingly normal, uh, uneventful, healthy pregnancy and delivery. Uh, she had a rare, extremely rare neurological condition, which was only able to be diagnosed um, in post-mortem. Um, and she, she died in our arms when she was six weeks old. Apologies. Um, but, you know, that's only part of her story. You know, she's a little sister and she's a big sister as well. Um, so when she was born, um, you know, I put her to the breast and she, she didn't have uh, that rooting, that sucking reflex. And a little while later, she turned blue and well, then she ended up in, in the incubator and in the photograph you can see there with all the tubes and the wires and the CPAP and the CFAM. And, you know, in the, the neonatal intensive care unit, I, I, I don't even remember having a, a chair to sit on. And I was so scared to touch her and I felt so surplus to requirements that, you know, that she belonged to the nurses and the doctors. And, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, and I just remember having this thought that, you know, hang on, I, I, I have her milk and only her mother has her milk. So, you know, this kind of proved to me that that I was her mother and I had a very valuable role. So um, that's what I decided to do. I was going to pump for her and that was um, that was going to be my focus. So, you know, in those very early days, um, hand expressing was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, I'm so glad I have these photos. My two very good friends were on the other end of the phone where I was sending them pictures like, look how much I'm getting. I'm getting practically nothing. What am I going to do? And, you know, everything is really sore. I'm just feeling bruised. I was terrified I was going to get mastitis. Um, but, you know, it, things got a little bit better. And, um, just when she's about 48 hours old into day three, I started responding to the pump and uh, and everything kind of settled down. And well, who knew milk looked <laughs> was that color? Um, when she was five days old, uh, she was transferred to Temple Street and the high dependency unit there in Michaels B is, is so different to intensive care. Um, they have it set up so that the mother really can take care of her baby as much as possible. So I was able to wash and sterilize all the equipment. Um, I had a lovely comfortable chair and um, Olivia and I spent her days just like that with herself on my chest um, and me pumping away. Um, and I suppose we just, we settled into, into a nice routine. Um, I pumped at the kitchen table in the morning making the school lunches for the older two. and. You know, we had lovely conversations where I'd say to them, you know, because I'm here with you, I'm making lo lots of oxytocin, which is the love hormone, and that's going into Olivia's milk. So she's getting your milk every day or your, your love in her milk every day. Um, and they love that. It was very special. So I suppose um, when we get to the the bit after she died, um, it's lovely to see that Anne McRae is on, on the call here. Um, I had an incredible conversation with Anne when Olivia was about three weeks old. Um, she was on continuous feeds of about 20 mils per hour. So she was having about 480 mils or so per day. And my freezer was getting backed up as was, you know, her, her shelf in Temple Street and the fridge. 
And I figured that she might not actually get to have all that milk by the time she was six months old. So I rang Anne and had a really lovely conversation. She spent a long time talking to me um, and she went through the questionnaire um, and subsequently sent out the box. And I kind of forgot about it after that. Um, but I suppose I, I was kind of set up um, when two weeks later, um, well, three weeks later, after Olivia, she took a turn and ended up in ICU. Um, and then we knew she was going to pass away. Um, and I suppose at that point, her wonderful nurses were in talking to me and, and trying to talk to me about my milk and what I was going to do with it. And I was able to say, I'd like to donate. Um, and her nurse just was fantastic. She got on the phone to Anne and she just sorted everything out, including the, the blood sample. And I'm incredibly grateful uh, for that. I know, Emma, you mentioned, you know, how to facilitate uh, women in, in giving that blood sample because it's just a tricky conversation to have when, when people don't necessarily know about milk donation and, and, and what it's for and to have to go into the ins and outs of explaining why you want to do this. Um, so this is why what Emma's doing is so amazing and having the framework there is, is just so amazing. Um, what I didn't tell anyone at that point, apart from my husband, was that I had no intention of stopping expressing. Um, so in, in those hours after Olivia passed away and, and all those sounds that any of you that are in ICU or HCU are familiar with, you know, the high flow oxygen, the heart monitor, beeping away, the sleep apnea monitor, um, you know, it, it's a noisy environment and it was just so quiet after she passed away. And then I had to attach the pump and my husband was holding Olivia and I just looked at him and I said, you know I'm not going to stop and he's like yeah I know I know so just having his support was was everything really um so that that there was my my last donation to the milk bank so I, I kept going until Olivia would have been seven months old um that's about five and a half liters of milk there so for for a healthy full-term baby that's about about five and a half days worth um, of milk. And it was just, I wish I'd taken more photos. I, I kind of didn't think to do that at the time. Um, I suppose, why, why would someone donate? I think, you know, anyone in breastfeeding circles know that the milk bank is always looking for mm -hmm. donations. And there I was with a full supply that I'd worked so hard to get, you know, um, so I used to set numerous alarms during the night and I slept through every one of them because when an alarm doesn't wake you like your baby does, you know. Um, and I, while I was afraid at the time to ask if I could donate any of Olivia's organs, I, I, I felt that the answer would be no, but I knew I could definitely donate her milk. Um, so the challenges and the rewards then. So it, I was it's hard to describe the, the fear that comes with having a very sick child in hospital, you know, unless you've been there. And then the fear of the worst thing, your child dying, actually happening. Um, the fear didn't leave after she died. It just um, got redirected. So I suppose because our breastfeeding rates in Ireland aren't amazing, um, I felt that people wouldn't necessarily understand why you'd breastfeed a living child never mind exclusively express for a living child never mind express after your child has died so I just thought people would think I was crazy um you know and I'd have to go into Tesco to buy breast pads and breast milk bags and I was terrified the checkout assistant you know in general conversation how's the baby how old's the baby I haven't seen the baby because I was in and out the whole time when I was pregnant um, I had the misfortune of the pump breaking down me twice, um, you know, and those conversations are very difficult to have, trying to, you know, talk to sales personnel to get a new pump and the general chit chat you have. Um, and the final one there, it's, it's, it's really, I find it tricky to talk about because I suppose it, it's hard, it's hard to know what to say. Um, my, my family, 
my family of origin that is um didn't really know what to say to me around um my expressing after Olivia died and and therefore pretty much said nothing and I found that silence painful and and really really difficult um but the um the rewards then it so when I was back in that neonatal intensive care unit and I was like I can express for her that was like proof that I was her mother and after she died I needed that proof as well um, because it was like as if she just disappeared and she never existed um I remember being in the shower and looking down at my wobbly postnatal tummy and the little Lena Negra Negra that was there and thinking oh, she did exist I you know I I have given birth um and pumping her milk was just an extension of that it just proved you know the only reason I had milk was because it was Olivia's milk um and it made me feel very very close to her um it produced lots of oxytocin which is very relaxing um it made for the most beautiful conversations with children you know some people donate their time through volunteering some people donate money dad donates blood mum donates olivia's milk so it was just just a really special special time i suppose um and um, you know making a difference in in the lives of others was a real um a real factor as well knowing that my milk was going to other tiny babies in in situations very similar to ours um was incredibly meaningful um, and healing um, and her legacy um just like holly mentioned you know and emma you know seven years on here i am talking about her and it's just it's really really important um my own health and it was it was lovely to hear holly talk about her health as well it was it was something that i really thought about you know the oxytocin being so relaxing making sure that my milk was good enough for the milk bank so watching you know my coffee intake um certainly having very little alcohol um and there is nothing like um, a full full breast to get you out of bed in the morning you know that needs you, you need to pump that off and um, so it was I felt it was really really good for me so that it wasn't just for the little babies that were going to be getting it, it was it was very much for for me and my own health as well um so this these are the thank you notes that I got um from the milk bank and they were just uh so wonderful to get and they told me where the milk went um, and I got a little badge as well, which is in the what was in the previous slide there uh, in the background. And uh, Anne rang me on Christmas Eve in 2014, 15 days after Olivia passed away, to tell me that her first donation was going to six babies in the Royal in Belfast. And it was just incredible. Um, beautiful Christmas present. Um, from Olivia to the babies, but also to me. And all in all, uh, her milk went to 38 babies um, across the island of Ireland. So as, as mentioned um, by Cora and, um, and by Emma, not, not every mother is going to be able to donate. Um, so she's undergone IVF or had a blood transfusion or had her placenta encapsulated and taken the pills. It, and unfortunately, it rules, rules her out. Um, but there are lovely um, things that can be done as well. And, and I'm so delighted to see this in the framework. Um, you know, there's breast milk jewellery. I had a lotion made. Um, a local lady here makes creams and lotions and lotions, um, beautiful things. And she made uh, a lotion for me with Olivia's milk. Um, the pictures of glass that you see there were done by Helen Hancock. She blows, um, she's a glass blower and she puts breast milk into it. So mine is the bottom left there. And the, the other two pieces there are um, from her own baby um, where she blew the glass with her baby's ashes. So they're really, really beautiful things there. So um, th there are some options there. So I, I threw in some quotes from the brief from other bereaved mums. So when I told 
um, some mums on a group that I'm on that I was going to do a talk. I, I just asked them about uh, milk donation and, and these are some of their quotes. Um, I would have loved to do the same, but it was never mentioned to us. If for a second I'd have known I could have done this, I do believe it would have helped me. I do think it should be discussed with mothers as an option. I didn't know donating was an option. I found it really, really upsetting to have my first ever breast milk and no baby to give it to. I do wonder, had I known pumping and donating was an option, could it have helped me too? I wish someone had sat down with me and discussed milk. I wish there wasn't fear and mixed messages. I wish they had told me about donating, but made it very clear that there was no expectation or pressure. And this lady, the, the bottom quote, um, this was her third child and she had breastfed her older babies. We found out she was sick at the anomaly scan. I often thought about what I would do with her milk, but was never brave enough to ask. And nobody ever asked me either. I wish I had been asked and had the option. So, you know, around the time of death, we have the most horrific conversations you could imagine. Um, whether to take your child off life support, you know, off the ventilator, and if they come off the ventilator, are we going to have a do not resuscitate in place? Um, Post-mortem organ and tissue retention and then what happens with those organs or tissues um, that are retained do you want to have them buried later on or you know do you want to have them cremated um, you know there's funeral arrangements picking out a coffin a burial plot the awful phone calls to child benefit and the maternity leave offs asking a mother about her milk is not the worst question she can be asked and in fact it could be you know one that changes her life and gives it so much more meaning if, if that's what she chooses to do giving her the choice means that she can choose if she doesn't have the choice then you know it's it's not fair on her basically oops um so giving her the information so that she's impaired. So I, Denise's um, leaf it there and uh, Julie Edwards leaf it there um, about what happens with your milk after um, your baby passes away. So I'll just leave you with the, the quotation um, from Claire Wineland who is a 21 year old girl lady who died after complications with um, cystic fibrosis. And she's just a really positive, person in the world um, and it all comes back to creating meaning um, in adversity so we're part of this giant human epic story we get to be a part of human history we get to add to it we have something to give we realize it's what we're creating that matters it's what we're adding to this beautiful story that matters we can change the world Oh, thank, thank you, you jo Joanne. Thank you so much, Joanne. Yeah, I'm thank so you, glad Joanne. that you came. Thank you, Joanne. That was, I mean, such a powerful presentation. Um, and thank you for sharing your your story and Olivia's story. I think it's um, everyone here has learned so much from it, and I think that's really important for everyone involved in healthcare. So. Thank you. And again, you'll read in the chat, there's so many people, um, uh, you know, so grateful for, for sharing your story. So thanks for that. Thanks. Thank you.